Welcome to the Wade Center's podcast. A podcast of Wheaton College. Welcome to the Wade Center podcast. This is Dr. Crystal Downing, the co-director of the Marion E. Wade Center in Wheaton, Illinois, along with my husband, co-director and co-inhabitant, David C. Downing. Was that, was that a sigh? It sounded like you went, <laughs> along with my uh, husband. <laughs> and our producer, who has become something of a co-inhabitant in our basement. <laughs> I do not live in the daddy's basement. <laughs> well, sometimes it feels like it. We have a lot of podcasts, and it's a delight every time we see Aaron joining us because... He becomes the tertium quid, and I call him that because I got it from the book we are reading and discussing for today, The Discarded Image by C.S. Lewis. We had listeners recommend it, and Aaron really wanted us to discuss it. And before David gives the background to it, Aaron, why don't you tell us why you really wanted to read this book well, and discuss it? <laughs> I have to be honest. I-, I wanted a good excuse to go back and reread the whole book. Oh. <laughs> uh, and then when I picked it up, I remembered that uh, the first time that I had read it, which was the only time I had read it before this, I hadn't read the whole thing. I did that thing that you do with academic books where you read the introductory chapters and then you skip ahead to the end to the conclusion <laughs> and then you... At that point, you go, oh, is there anything in the middle that I want to go sort of expand? <laughs> I never did that. I always was a good girl about you, reading my ac- academic books through. You've never done that with like a 500-page no. academic book. No. You just read the whole thing. Yes. Wow. I had okay. uh, one time a student left her textbook in the classroom, and I opened it to see who it was. And she'd read the acknowledgments, and she had yellow highlighter. Oh, on. oh no. <laughs> I'd like to thank my dissertation director. <laughs> And I wow. go, there's something basic about book reading that yeah. you're not getting. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, so go, reading back through it this time. Um, yeah, I, I think I think it's a great book, but I don't know that it's the kind of book that you want to curl up in front of the fireplace. Right. It's it's definitely a more advanced, it's it's an academic book. Right, right. And perhaps And that's why, why this is going to be a really short podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you no. for no, tuning there's, in. There's a lot of stuff to unpack oh, in here. Oh my goodness. Really. There is brilliant stuff here. First, before we start discussing, David, why don't you tell us the background of this book? Well, these were originally a series of lectures on the medieval worldview uh, by Lewis. He said, you know, people don't really understand medieval literature or even medieval history without realizing their worldview is so different from ours. Mm. And so unless you understand the, he calls it the backdrop or the background uh, under which all these literary texts were being written, you're going to misinterpret the literature or dismiss the literature. This is another job of rehabilitation. Lewis loved the medieval worldview, and he constantly heard medieval, dark ages, ignorant, mm-hmm. superstitious, you know, dying of plague. And suddenly the Renaissance happened, and everybody became smart and well dressed and did beautiful yeah. paintings. Oh, right. yeah, totally. Yeah. So he's, right. always, he's always trying to get back at that great chasm between the ignorant, superstitious Christian Middle Ages and the wonderful humanistic Renaissance. And so he's just going to lay out for you, this is the backdrop. And interestingly, he says the medieval worldview and their model of the universe was ultimately the most beautiful aesthetic object they created collectively. Normally you would say, oh, that was a great poem. That was a great painting. That was a great piece of architecture. But he says this conception of of the cosmos was actually the most beautiful thing they created. Mm. And it integrated architecture and circles and crystal spheres, but it also had the intellectual energy. He says that if you take Salisbury Cathedral as a work of architecture and Thomas Aquinas as a work of philosophy and then Dante as a work of poetry, Mm. they all three had this sense of this gigantic system and worldview, which is behind the the, yeah. uh, the philosophy and the art they're creating. And so he's going to just go ahead and tell us what it is. It's this gigantic, it's almost like this cosmic chandelier. Yeah. There's all these wheels and glass and light reflecting. Uh, all the planets are in transparent spheres. The reason they circle transparent, God, transparent spheres. And the reason they circle around the center 
is not gravity, but it's kindly inclining. Yeah. They're yeah. so in love with God, they kind of want to continue circling God the way a moth might circle a light. Yeah, yeah. So it's a um, it's the uh, ambitious undertaking, and it really has to do with your aesthetic response to the medieval worldview, rather than just saying, "Well, that's wrong." You know, there's there are no creatures living in in interstellar space. So he's going to try to convince us of the aesthetic beauty of the model before he talks about the scientific accuracy mm. of the model. Mm. Let me read some reviews that came out. After this was published, one person said, whether we were his pupils in the classroom or no, we are all his pupils and we shall not look upon his like again. Wow. Yeah. Oh. The, the power of C.S. Lewis. And that was Helen Gardner, who was a famous critic herself. Dante Scholar, right. Yeah. yeah. And uh, if the book sometimes daunts, and it does, you to read this book, you'll learn about Pseudo Dionysius and Apuleius and Constantius and Statius, people that I never encountered in my education. But it has described a model which has passed away into a mist. Although what C.S. Lewis did in this book, The Discarded Image, which was published after he died. It was published in 64, right? Right. right. So obviously he has a preface to it. So he had started the process before he died. But well, these lectures go back to the 30s at Oxford. Well, even Hooper says to 26, before Lewis was even a Christian, he was starting to lecture right. on right. the medieval oh, wow. perspective. So is this something that Hooper collected and turned into a book or had Lewis been working on? No, it Lewis had worked on it. Uh, yeah, have. I think he planned on doing his lectures. There's also Spencer's Images of Life in 64. People realized that his lectures were going to be classics. Mm. And so they started collecting gotcha. the lectures. Well, something else I learned from Walter Hooper, who has an overview on Lewis, yeah. because he, of course, was the executor of Lewis's estate, is there is a book that both David and I encountered in grad school called uh, The Elizabethan World Picture by right. Tilliard, e. Tilliard mm. who right. was a professor at Cambridge. Yeah. And in 1930, Tilliard had published a book on Milton that essentially makes, and this is what Lewis says about it, Tilliard's book is plainly the proposition that all poetry is about the poet's state of mind. So it's like Tilliard was trying to get into, what was Milton really thinking here? Oh, yeah. And so that started a debate between Lewis and Tilliard, who was about 10 years older than Lewis, and they published it as the personal heresy, mm. a controversy. And that was in 1939, where, and you can figure out what was going on when you read the discarded image, that Lewis is saying, no, you can't just talk about person's view of things apart from the model yeah. in which that poet's perspectives are situated. Yeah, their worldview. And it shows that... Lewis changed this famous person, Tilliard, because mm. not long after the personal heresy and their, their controversy, three years later, Tilliard produces a book called The Elizabethan World Picture, which shows us how the Elizabethan culture in general regarded mm. things. And you can tell a lot of it is gotten from Lewis. And, and this still, the, uh, when you read Shakespeare, you realize how much of his allusions are based on what Lewis would call the medieval model. Oh, definitely. Uh, that's a great book by Tilliard. It and, is. It's wonderful. And he got the idea from Lewis that we need to, like if somebody tried to understand the 20th century without knowing about Freud and Marx and Darwin, you'd have a lot of illusions you'd be very confused about. Yeah. So the odd thing is I don't think we see the intellectual backdrop of our own generation. No, because you're embedded say, oh, in it. You yeah. can't rise above it to see it. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can try, but yeah. it's, it's you know, I mean, that's Lewis. Lewis says the only way to really see that is to go see somebody else's. Like, you know, that's why he right. talks about reading the importance of reading old books is you go read an old book and you realize, oh, wow, these people think very different than me. They have different opinions mm -hmm. on this topic. And it helps you to see your own opinions and unquestioned assumptions that you have about the world as different or right. you know, uh, not natural because it's easy for us to assume that like, well, everybody thinks this way and mm -hmm. everybody has thought this way. 
Um, we were talking in church a while back about Old Te- the Old Testament, and I was thinking about Old Testament laws, and every time in biblical studies it comes up, you start talking about Old Testament laws, there's all these laws you pull up and you go, well, how would somebody look at that and think on the face of it that is the most just way to handle the situation? Mm. And part of it is we're coming at it with our worldview imposing right. our and we're imposing our yes. judgments and our ethics and all our standards on this thing. And, and, you know, we don't, we have no consideration of what they thought and what they felt and how foreign the law must have felt to them uh, and those sorts of things. And so, yeah, I think it's really helpful uh, to go back and read books. And what Lewis does here is he distills all of his knowledge of the medieval world into this book. There's sections where he just, it's a master class of like connecting right. the dots between right. all these authors. I was there was a couple times where I was reading it and I just like made a highlight or made a note like Lewis is incredibly smart. Now I see you know I see oh. why he was a professor. Right. <laughs> he was you know brilliant. and teaching yes. these things you just you kind of see it come out. He wasn't just a guy that had opinions on a lot of things. Right. Right. And wrote books. He was a professor that yeah. had this extra yeah. knowledge. And he knew cultural history. Sometimes people don't uh, arise above their discipline. They're always doing literary history or political mm-hmm. history. But I, I love just his his almost godlike overview of like the way culture spread. It started out in Hellenistic Greece, and then it got down to Alexandria, which was very Hellenistic. And then it got into Arab scholars, and then it got past to Italy. That was a fascinating section, yeah, on how cultural trends at that time spread. Yeah, because mm-hmm. late, later on, you'd have Romanticism would start in Germany or Europe, and then it's happening in Britain a generation later, and then it's happening in America, yeah, in the eighteen fifties. Mm-hmm. And you can kind of see these cultural waves spreading across, yeah. the map. Mm-hmm. And the trouble is. Um, or uh, the trouble was with the worldview in which Lewis was embedded, he was able to rise above it because he was a Christian at a time at, where the model was this modernist sense mm. of autonomy yeah. that basically Christianity is an outmoded superstition of the past. The word medieval wasn't even coined until 1834. Four, really? Yeah. To talk about, oh, well, there's that middle period yes. between the great yeah, classical medieval. thinkers. 1834, you sure it was more like early 1835? No, it was 1834. <laughs> yeah, I checked it. I, I and, um, <clears throat> and then the Renaissance, yeah. the rebirth of great thinking, which kind of recognized, well, Christianity shouldn't be the basis of our thought. So by being a Christian... Lewis did have a perspective that challenged this, the model of his own time. Yeah. And it made him a, a forethinker. In fact, I'm in the process of writing for Rutledge an article how Lewis, and I'm going to argue, he is really the first postmodernist. Mm. And what he is saying in this book is what postmodernists were saying that every era yeah. operates by a model. Yeah. Postmodernists were challenging an evolutionary theory that, oh, those dumb medievalists, postmodernists said, no, they were smarter in many ways than people that came after us. Well, was, the beginning of the book feels very postmodern. He's talking yes. about models. Yeah. Uh, and we're, we'll talk about Barfield at some point, saving the appearances. The original idea was you look at the way the planets are moving, you look at the way the moon is uh, moving, suddenly you see a supernova and you say, wait a minute, the distant stars aren't always... They're not timeless. They're not eternal. Yeah, there's yeah. somehow that was kind of a shock to them. Yeah. But they have this model of trying to save the appearances. But uh, according to Lewis's friend Barfield, Galileo said, oh, this isn't just my model of planetary motion. This is the way things really are. Yeah. And that was a big step to say, you know, show me your best model versus this is reality. Yeah. And ironically, now we're reversing the process. Uh People are saying, well, this is my model of waves and particles, or this is my model of dark matter. This is the best model Uh, we have. Yeah. I loved when he said the medieval model was an answer, not a question. Yeah. Because modern science, the model is always 
growing and it's always in question. Mm. So ironically, we're almost pre-Galilean now. Yeah. Can uh, I can I read two quotes related to that that I highlighted? So one of them he says... One of them is, it takes a heap of living in a house to make a home. <laughs> what? Was that That's the one you it. were going no. for? Oh, okay, sorry. at all. No. Sorry. Uh, it says, the business of the natural philosopher is to construct theories which will save appearances. A scientific theory must save or preserve the appearances, the phenomenon it deals with in the sense of getting them all in, doing justice to all of them. And then he goes on and he talks about how the best models are those that make the fewest assumptions. And he gives that great example about Shakespeare. And he's like, (laughs) how do we account for the bad bits in Shakespeare? One theory is that some of it was written by Shakespeare and some of it was written by somebody else. Right. And he's like, but then the other theory is that sometimes Shakespeare had bad days. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) And he's like, it seems like it's probably more likely that Shakespeare had some bad days. And that made me think of Pauline scholarship because there's a lot of Pauline scholarship. It's like, well, this doesn't sound. And in my head, I'm like, you know, if if somebody examined my writings over the course of my of life, course. it's like my writing from 10 years ago versus my writing today be totally different. And I, you know, I can see a thousand years from now, somebody's like, well, there's clearly two different people. Exactly. This is the real Aaron. And <laughs> it's like, no, no, it's just, I changed my mind. I changed how I wrote and how I think over time. Uh, yes. Especially Paul, you know, exactly. he could have just gotten back from a beating or from in jail. <laughs> or He's somebody not else's. Have, have the same felicitous prose. Yeah. Or somebody else is writing down what he's saying. Yeah. Right, there's right. lots of, but anyway, so then he goes on, he talks about the, and this is related to the quote that you said, David, about the change from a provisional theory to one that was assumed to be the facts like this is not just a theory about the world or a model but this is the thing itself and so he says the real reason why copernicus raised no ripple and galileo raised a storm may well be that whereas the one offered a new supposal about celestial motions the other insisted on treating this supposal as fact right if so the real revolution consisted not in a new theory of the heavens but in a new theory of the nature of theory Right. Yes, I love right. that. It's a theory about the nature of theory. And that has affected even the sciences, postmodern science, where there is a one scientist who discusses, he believes in evolution, but because of postmodernism, he says uh, the theory, and this is from 1994, the theory of natural selection is so elegant and powerful this sounds like Lewis, so elegant and powerful as to inspire a kind of faith in it. Not blind faith, really, since the faith rests on the theory's demonstrated ability to explain so much about life, Mm -hmm. but faith nonetheless. And so he says, I have faith in the theory of evolution, but he admits it's a faith based on a model that is that saves the appearances. Yeah. So C- converging what, probabilities yes, is what Lewis Cardinal Newman would call it. Lewis anticipated this by decades and decades. Yeah. Well, Thomas Kuhn wrote Structure of Scientific Revolutions in 62. Right. This book wasn't published till 64, but these ideas go back to the 30s. Right. So he was already playing with the idea that science is not this uh, objective march toward exactly. truth. It's mm-hmm. yeah. there's you know, various trends, sociological things. We talked about euthanasia for a while. It seemed real logical to try to improve the the world gene pool by eliminating the unfit. Yeah, eugenics. But then, yeah, yeah. N- another generation says, oh, what, what a horrific idea. What an abominable right, idea. Right, right. Yeah. And as Lewis says, and like every postmodernist says, language has its own outlook. Language shapes mm-hmm. how we see things. And eugenics, the word was coined by Darwin's cousin. And it just seemed to make sense that, you know, we want the best of humanity. Yeah. And, but the model was evolutionary. Yeah. And so you're just helping move the evolution along. Yeah, I, I really like another metaphor that Lewis uses in this book. He says, for the medievals... They felt themselves to be at the bottom of the stairs looking up to a glory that is yet before them, Mm. whereas the moderns or the people of Lewis's own day, he was didn't use the word modernist because that was used later to describe this era. But they feel they're at the top of the staircase looking back at the dark superstitions of yeah. medievalism yeah. that they have climbed beyond. And Lewis challenged it, as did postmodernism. Yeah. 
One of the ideas he introduces at the beginning of the book that I thought was really helpful, um, and this is one of the things that I remembered uh, reading the discarded image the first time, reading the beginning and the end, uh, <laughs> was uh, towards the beginning he he tries to help you understand where they came from, how they treated mm -hmm. evidence, and how that informed the way that they pass things on, and how we sort of look at things differently. And sometimes we would look at them and go, well, why would you believe that just because you read it in such and such? And so he has a quote, at the I think it's in the first or second chapter, where he says, when we speak of the Middle Ages as the ages of authority, we are usually thinking about the authority of the church, but they were the ages not only of her authority, but of authorities. And so he gives mm -hmm. a number of examples of places where he gives an example of this English poem, uh, Brute or something right. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, that where he's talking about the air is inhabited by uh, by beings. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. And then he traces that back, and he's like, "Well, he got that from this manuscript, and that person got it from this manuscript." Yes. And he takes you all the way back, and he and he says like the the gap between the original source of that idea and us and the guy who wrote this in the 13th century or whatever, 12th century, uh, whoever he was, um, like it's bigger. Waste, like yeah. yeah. So in other words, like basically he's saying. These sort of, sa he calls them savages, but these ideas of sort of pre-civilized people have been transmitted through this line of authors. And people just, they would just pick up a book and it would be like, well, if David Downing wrote it in a book, <laughs> then it must be true. So I'm going to sort of elaborate on or expound on what David said and just sort of pass it along because David, I see David as an authority. But the idea of scientific theories and of testing things and of sort of questioning what's come before you, uh, criticism, that critical mindset was just not a thing back then. In one and, of his other books, he says the, uh, one of the defects of the medieval mind was the inability to say Bosch. You're, you're reading along and you go, now fire is hot and warm and the creature that can live in fire is a salamander. And at some point they should just go, I don't think so. I yeah. don't believe but it's interesting how often imaginatively in the, the silver chair, when they're looking down into Bism and there's all this fire, there's salamanders that can live there. So he's rehabilitating the idea that salamanders can live in fire. Yeah. Uh, even though obviously, plausibly speaking, how yeah. could they? He says, he says later on, he says, in our own society, most knowledge depends on observation, but the Middle Ages depended predominantly on books. Right. Yes. Yeah. And so this idea that they were uh, superstitious, uneducated people is outrageous. And uh, here Lewis is proving that. And I, I love the fact, Aaron, that you mentioned that scientific theories are supposals mm. because that is the word that Lewis used right. to describe the Narnia Chronicles. Mm. They are supposals based on a particular worldview that yeah. C.S. Lewis had. Yeah. But they're not, he doesn't want them to be allegories. Yeah. And, oh, well, this corresponds to this, and we've talked about allegory a lot right, in this podcast. Right. Yeah. So to have him use it in his greatest academic achievement, the, dis the discarded image, but also to describe the Narnia Chronicles, just again, proves his brilliance yeah. that everything was connected, but he could communicate to radically different audiences. Not many people can do that. Yeah. And in many ways, his mind was like the medieval mind. And he oh. took everything he read and kept adding it to this great cosmic chandelier. Yes. Uh, this is where Christian theology fits. Here's where Platonic philosophy yeah. fits. Yes. Here's where my love of literature and fantasy fits. So he kind of was a great uh, cosmic world builder himself. He says, he use. says at his most characteristic medieval man was not a dreamer nor a wanderer. He was an organizer, a codifier, a builder of systems. He yes. wanted a place for everything and everything <laughs> in the right place. So yeah, hundred percent. My father used to repeat that. Oh really? All the time. <laughs> a place for everything yes. and everything oh, in its place. My goodness. Yeah. Yes. That that was and just part of my childhood. The older we get, the more we agree. <laughs> yeah, right. When you're young, David. I'll remember where I put my phone. Yeah. <laughs> where where are my glasses? <laughs> well, and also the reason this is worth reading, even if you aren't a literary scholar, and it does get dry. Um, someone described it as walking through um, rough countryside on a beautiful day and you have to climb over some 
rocks and <laughs> it, but you're getting exuberance. And so the rocks kind of hold you back. And so there are these parts that will hold people back. But as a Christian, it helped me understand why certain um, assumptions become part of Christianity yes. that were inherited from what Lewis calls pagans. Yeah. And pagan isn't a negative word for Lewis. In, in the medieval model, a pagan was just those great thinkers before Christianity, like Plato and Aristotle. And Plato is really the person who generated this idea that suicide is an ultimate sin yeah. and um, explains why people um, interpret the unforgivable sin mm -hmm. as suicide. Well, that goes way back to Plato, yep. and Plato influenced medieval Christians yeah. like Augustine, Aquinas, Aristotle. Um, yeah, yeah, even talks about guardian angels, the origin of the idea of yes. guardian angels and sort of uh, demonology and angelology and all the different spirits and things like that. It's, right. It's really fascinating to realize how much of this traces back to sort of pre-Christian ideas and yeah. philosophy. The They're idea of, of heaven as an award, yeah. a reward, I should say. Yeah, an award. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're awarded with heaven. A go. reward. Um, and, and that's a trouble within Christianity where mm. people just only think of themselves. They don't think of, of the gift of salvation. They just go, oh, I got to do this, this, and this in order to get the reward of heaven. Yeah. Um, but that goes way back to pagan thinkers. And another one that struck me is this emphasis from, this is from Statius, on the importance of virginity. And that mm. affected the church where um, they actually developed in the Roman Catholic Church in the 19th century, the idea of the Immaculate Conception, which doesn't refer to Mary. That means the conception of Mary. So even Mary's mother was yeah. a virgin when she yeah. was born. Yep. And, you know, you kind of, Protestants look at that and go, oh, please, why do you have, because then you have this infinite regress. Well, if yeah. Mary's mother uh -huh. was a virgin, well, what about her mother, yep. et cetera? And, but it's because of this. The impeccable grandma. There's going to be a. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think they do cover that. There's something about she recovered her immaculateness from Christ's work on the cross. Remember our. Our uh, colleague Matt Millinder talks about the uh, Catholic doctrine of the yeah, Immaculate it kind Conception. Of, yeah. It ends up becoming kind of a closed system. Right. Yeah. Right. right. That in but, many ways is sort of designed to avoid any messy humanity, you know. But right. it was because of these great classical thinkers who Lewis calls pagan thinkers. But even that word pagan has such a different yeah. meaning for us today. Yeah. And in modernism, it had negative, but now people pagan, oh yeah, that's just drinking and, you know, <laughs> playing around, let's yeah. be pagan. But uh, uh, anyway, um, so the church just absorbed this, and even apart from the Immaculate Conception, this idea that, like, Mary was 12 and that Joseph was an 80-year-old mm -hmm. widower, that's yeah. actually part of writings in medieval, but they were absorbing this worldview that preceded them. And that's that's helpful for us to understand, well, where did these ideas come from? Yeah. Which is, I think it shows his capacious mind and his powers of discrimination is that he doesn't try to fudge. He says, Boethius actually wasn't, his, his philosophy wasn't very Christian. It was more stoic. Yeah. And he'll say, well, actually this idea came from the difference between the earth and the sky came from Aristotle. It'd be kind of easy to say, oh, the wonderful Christian imagination came up with all this. But he actually admits yeah. there's a strange mixture of Christian right. and pagan in right. the medieval yeah. worldview. Right. I think there's something really healthy in that, though. Yes, is, of course. Because it, rather than saying that, rather than assuming that you have to defend absolutely everything, um, you can say, you know, you know what, I, I'm interested in the truth, and it's helpful for us to differentiate between something that we inherited from Aristotle or that we inherited from Plato um, who wasn't a Christian right. uh, from, you know, what's actually in scripture. And cause I think it, you know, then otherwise you end up defending things that right, are right. not at all based on scripture or even a, you know, revelation from, from God There's you know, things that were came up with by human beings to quote unquote, save the appearances. And then they ended up getting incorporated right. because 
they liked the model or they read it in another book or something like that. And it's like, we, we don't have to spend our time defending all those kinds of things. We're interested in the truth. We're not interested in defending this uh, line of supposals by authors over thousands of years. Right, right. One of the ones that struck me the most is uh, Plato's emphasis on a triad. Yes, oh, yeah, I love right. that chapter. The triad, yeah. Oh, my goodness. And just and, the idea behind it. Right, right, right. So that body and soul, what connects body and soul, spirit. spirit. And you can see then why early Christians developed the idea of a trinity. I mean, triads were just part of the cultural discourse, but it gets you away from either or thinking. And the trouble with our culture right now, of course, it's just this either or polarized thinking where you're lobbing weaponized words at the other side. So the idea of a trinity um, and Tertullian coined the word Trinity yeah. in 200 way out because the Bible doesn't use the word Trinity. Yeah. But they were reading the Bible. I was thinking, I was thinking that was 1834. David, <laughs> they were reading the Bible through so the smart. lens of the great thinkers that had yeah. shaped them. And as Lewis puts it in the very first chapter, he says that Christianity is a wash spread over a cultural canvas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we ha- that is why it's important to read history, to understand yeah. how history, and rather than going like some people today said, oh, well, I can't be a Christian because, you know, Christians supported slavery back in the 19th century. Well, Christianity itself is situated in certain cultures, and Christians imbibe the understanding of those cultures. And so that's why we have to um, read it and not denounce them as them as individuals so much as to denounce the culture in which they were embedded, which warped their Christianity. Yeah. Yeah. He, I, I like that chapter where he talks about the cosmic triad because it's so applicable in, in numerous different areas. So one of the examples he is, is uh, the tension between reason and appetite and he right. says, yes. reason and appetite must not be left facing one another across a no man's land. A trained sentiment of honor or chivalry must provide the mean that unites them and integrates the civilized man. And so there's this idea of you have reason over here on one side and appetite or desire on the other. And then in, in the middle, you have sort of right sentiment or right emotion in the middle to unite them. Which um, is a precy for evolution of man. Mm-hmm. Right. The idea that you yeah. need the third thing. Right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. And and, and and it makes sense, like you said, Crystal, because the idea is if you only have the binary, then one of you is wrong and one of you is right. right. Or the tertiary option is some sort of compromise in the middle where both of you lose. <laughs> yes. And, and nobody wants that solution either. And so if that's your only model, then you're like, well, then we're going to have to fight to the death or one of us, we're going to have to compromise or we're going to have to give up on something that we believe to be true. And as Christians, we don't want to do that. And so there's this idea that like the, the triad, the tertiary, it solves it because something is the mediator between the two or they all work together. He gives the example of the uh, political triad, the um, a triad of sovereign executive and subjects, the stellar powers command, the angelic beings execute and the terrestrials obey there's just this order that's built into everything. Right. That's triadic. Right. And that's right. So many beautiful. triads that yeah. developed out of that. And as though it were a basic principle of the universe, yeah. um, as in Romans, it was like written on their heart. So a skeptic, and again, people see what they want to see. Someone anti-Christian might want to say, oh, well, they just got the Trinity from Plato. That's not at all what I'm saying. It's, it's more like what G.K. Chesterton talks about in Everlasting Man, it says that God established this scenario where the incarnation came at the right moment Mm -hmm. in human civilization. 
So it's that, like Chesterton's Everlasting Man. Yeah, that's what yeah, I just said. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I blanked for a second. Sorry, um, <clears throat> but it's also like uh, Lewis's discussion in Miracles about uh, the dying god myths and yes, seeds going into the ground. Right, you because you could say like, oh well, people had dying gods before Jesus came on the scene. Or you could say, well, you're just basing this idea on seeing seeds go into the ground and then spring back up to life. And that's why, you know, we have Easter in the spring. And you could try and undermine the death yes. and resurrection of Jesus by pointing to these examples. Or you could do what Lewis does and say, or maybe that's just the way the world is designed exactly. because right. it was designed by right. God. And obviously everything is going to point to or reflect who he is, right? And 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 if this is what his design was for his son, then of course the world would be designed that way, you know? Right. And so it would make sense that we would see triads everywhere if the world was created and superintended by a triadic God. Right, right. right. And right. that that Christ's um, coming to earth happened when Greek culture had developed this mm -hmm. sophisticated sense of triads and the idea of a of heaven and of divinity and all these things that so that the message would spread rather than Jesus just being another element only constricted to Judaism. Yeah. Uh you know one triad uh, that people often uh, add to this conversation is truth, beauty, and goodness. Mm. Uh, and I would actually say one needs to be careful not to get triadomania. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. When it comes to truth, beauty, and goodness, truth is the easiest to establish. If somebody says it's yeah. 93 million oh, miles yeah. to the sun, you can establish that empirically. Goodness is more difficult because for many centuries, slavery seemed acceptable. Yes. And suddenly in a fairly short space of time, it was utterly unacceptable. It was utterly savage. Some people think uh, you you had to have slavery. You have to force people to work. People don't want to work in the fields and do. Uh, and it, it either has to be by force or by reward. And when they didn't have a uh, currency system or an infrastructure which allowed for full barter, you had to use force to get people to work. Uh, this, this historian was claiming that slavery uh, died out because we had it monetary system where you could pay workers mm -hmm. anyway i'm getting but then the harder one is is beauty when you go to a modern art exhibit mm -hmm. a lot of people who are fairly well educated wouldn't see the beauty but people who are experts say yes that is a wonderful work of creativity but there's a, quite a bit of dissonance between truth goodness and beauty being equally um um what's the word i'm looking for triune or they're they're of equal self-evident uh, maybe self-evident they have the same ontological status. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of but sort. even the way we define truth now is a reflection of the model that we've been trained in. Right. That it's based on yeah. scientifically verifiable yeah. subject, whereas the medievals would, didn't even think that way. Yeah. Right. And so truth, beauty, and goodness themselves are also part of of the model and different yeah. models define each in right. different ways. Yeah. And there, and there, and there, yeah. And there's an element that's without getting into, they're tied to the three graces and the sort of right. gift reciprocal relationship economy that they had back then. Like there's, it's, it's all, it's all interconnected. It's all, everything's built on everything else. I think and, fork and knife and spoon is in there somewhere. <laughs> There's a lot of triads out there. <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about the spheres you mentioned at the beginning, David, oh, about right. the, this uh, model of the spheres? It's very fascinating to me. One of the things that stood out to me was this idea that because Earth doesn't move, it doesn't need a mover. It doesn't need a sort of celestial being to superintend right. it around the uh, the cosmos or whatever. So there's all these rules related to it, and you know the moon is a part of it and stuff. Um, is there anything that you guys wanted to talk about from from that section that you thought was interesting? Well, we obviously showed the ongoing influence of astrology. You can really see that in Shakespeare. Yes. But he talks about how uh, astrology doesn't predetermine your fate; it only influences it. Even the word influence comes from astrology. Yeah. Um, I love the idea of these crystal spheres. He oh, also that's says, why you married exactly. <laughs> Uh, it's it would be a beautiful object and I'm to try to make a, a mobile out of. More and more. I was gonna oh. say you guys didn't know it, Dave. <laughs> Crystal. <laughs> Not only is her name Crystal, but she looks like a spirit. No. <laughs> 
<laughs> She's all bundled up. <laughs> um, but I like that he stressed the beauty of it and also that he was able to show how much ongoing influence there is. Our words, you know, a disaster. The stars were lined yeah. up yeah. Uh, incorrectly. Um, Even so influenza. When we talk about the mm, flu, right. influenza is like, yeah. it must come from the stars. Well, yeah. but there's also this idea that like sort of everything is kind of flowing down from the father, this very hierarchical model. And, right. And each, each uh, different level is, you know, sending messages and communicating things and everything's coming down from the father. And so there's this divine economy um, that we're all participating in. And so as opposed to, you know, we tend to think like, well, whatever the sky looked like when I was born has absolutely nothing to do with the choices yeah. that I make. Right. I mean, everything is independent of everything else in a sort of our worldview. Back then it was very much this divine economy that everyone is participating it's in. It's all interconnected. Yeah. 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 But yeah. you're a Libra and they're very skeptical. So that's, why, <laughs> that's why you don't believe Actually, it. I'm a Taurus. Oh, you're a Taurus. <laughs> I have no idea what that means, but that, uh, yeah, that I'm a Taurus. That's a bull yeah. in a china shop? Yeah, I guess so, maybe. I don't yeah. know. Uh, <laughs> Bullheaded? I don't know. <laughs> well, <clears throat> just reading this book, since I cha- taught Shakespeare for many years, it helped me understand some of the things in Shakespeare, like Hamlet talks about this quintessence of dust. And I just, we have changed the word quintessence to mean, oh, it's just quintessentially evil or quintessentially fun. But quintessence, that was the essence beyond the realm of changeability. So basically, Hamlet, and of course, Shakespeare was influenced by the medieval model, is saying that I'm both soul and body, the quintessential, but I'm also dust, you know, and this union and how do you figure it out? And the whole point of Hamlet is how to figure, is grappling with his responsibility as the, the son of a murdered man. And, and quint just means fifth. Yeah. There's already oh, four right. elements. Yeah. It's the beyond thing the united, four elements. Yeah, people four. think quintessence means like super essence, but yeah. it just right. means the fifth essence. The fifth. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, he he. In that chapter, he uh, has a quote in there. I won't read the whole thing, but he's talking about luxury and material splendor. And he mentions that in the modern world, that it's connected with nothing but money. And oftentimes we see it as ugly. You know, we use terms like gaudy. You remember that show back in the 90s where it was like the life of the rich, rich and, fa- and famous, lifestyle yeah. of the rich and famous, right. you know, and that guy would that weird voice and stuff. Um, and so he says, but what what a medieval man saw in all of that was heaven like the architecture of everything it's it symbolized all of these beautiful noble things and he said they were associated uh not with uh you know ugly stuff as with modern luxury but with graciousness and courtesy they could therefore be ingenuously admired without degradation for the admirer Mm. um this idea that they had an admiration for things that were beautiful and the complexity of it it also helps make sense of like why their sanctuaries were so beautiful right. and why they were so interested mm. in making churches be so, um, again, we, I, I'm searching for a word to use and I want to say gaudy, you know, they were so resplendent and beautiful mm. and adorned and, uh, and complex and technical. And today, you know, our churches that we tend to build, they look like, I don't know, they look like libraries or, yeah. or strip malls or something. Uh, like Just these sort well, of like bland, yeah. kind of ugly buildings. And that's the Protestant yeah. anti-image element that developed but in yeah. the 16th century. So, yeah. but anyways, that, that, to, to me that was very interesting. So then it makes sense why their model of the universe, what Lewis talks about as the model uh, of the spheres and of the heavens, would just be so beautiful and complex right. and everything's interlinked. and um, the spheres are crystal and there's light and it's just so beautiful mm-hmm. and inspires awe in mm-hmm. thinking about it. And you can sense as he's writing about it, that he feels like something was lost yes. in the beauty and the imagination when we gave up on that. And we moved to this, just this cold calculated science. You also can really sense that when you read the uh, ransom trilogy. I was going to say, yeah, imaginatively, he wants to show you what a glorious view of the universe this is. Yeah. Mm. When you go outside, you're not looking out into emptiness. You're looking up into the vault of heaven. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that was a very um, key strategy for him is to say, let me show them the imaginative beauty of the of the uh, medieval worldview if I can't convince them of its scientific accuracy. Mm-hmm. And even our word glamour related to this 
he says, actually comes from the word grammar in the yes. medievalism. That the order of how you put your words together in order to capture and be the the authority of the past and communicate that authority on is glamour. It's wondrous. Yeah. And now that word glamour, of course, has been reduced uh-huh. to skinny models, you know, <laughs> parading up and down runways. Yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, what does that tell you about our times? That'd be a great magic spell, though, to go, I, you, me, us, we. <laughs> it's an enchantment. You're using grammar on them. <laughs> well, again, and even the, the word way- the word grammar. means something totally different in our heads. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's like, right. oh, I hate grammar. He Grammar's meant boring. Much more about yeah. the power of language. Or they meant the power yeah. of language. Well, you can grammar. see all these remnants. We talk about ethereal music, and the ether was the medium beyond the moon. Oh, you have right. air going to right. the moon, but then you have ether. And some people thought angels were made of ether, and some people thought they were made of some kind of matter. Hence the discussion of how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. The issue was, do they have any weight or do right. they have no weight? Yeah. So there yeah. actually was a, but we say uh, the Empyrean, uh, which is the realm of fire. They believe mm-hmm. that the reason fire goes up is because it's trying to yeah. uh, reconnect with the cosmic Yeah, fire. well, because you, you had these elements and then there was a median that they traveled in, right? right and right. so, you know, you had light and there had to be a medium that it's traveling in. So you've got this ether and yeah, all these concepts. And it's interesting how they stick around. And some of them get forgotten or right. they get mixed in with things. I remember listening to um, some stuff this philosopher was talking about angels. And he was trying to define them very precisely based on all these ideas. And at the time, I thought, like, wow, this is so amazing that we have s- such great, precise definitions of these things. And now looking back, I'm realizing, like, oh, he's just sort of parroting this idea. And it's based on some of these things that we got from, like, Plato and stuff and how he's defining them and these ideas. And it, for me, it's helpful to just understand like, Oh, this is where some of these ideas are coming from. Cause it's not like there's an appendix at the end of our Bibles that gives us, yeah. a, you know, right, right. God's like, and a, and an angel is this and a right. demon is this, you know? Right. Right. Because the, the word daemon was positive. Yeah. Among the pagans. Yeah. Yeah. And it was in medieval times where it turned negative as they were trying to understand the order of the universe. Right. The other area where he clearly has an ax to grind is when he talks about the medieval view of the earth and how they fully understood that the earth was a sphere and they understood gravity. (laughs) Yes. And he goes into uh, talking about that map, uh, the map mound or whatever it is. Right. And trying to say, you know, okay, well, if you were going to depict a sphere, how would you, you know, they didn't, they hadn't mastered the art of projecting a three dimensional thing yeah. onto a two dimensional thing. Uh-huh. So like cut him some slack and he goes into saying, you know, like part of it was just meant to be beautiful. It wasn't meant to be useful. Nobody right. used it to navigate the seas. Um, and of course it has mistakes on there, but that even probably people that lived back then would have been able to see the mistakes. And so he does just this really good job of saying like, Let's not assume that they thought the earth was flat. We knew, actually know that they didn't think the earth was flat. Mm-hmm. And he he uh, he really wants to rehabilitate medieval people in the mind of readers to help them understand that, like, they weren't they weren't savages. They weren't brutes exactly. right. making mud pies. Yes. Um, and because there's very much this idea that, like, there was the fall of Rome And then everything between there and when the Renaissance happened was, you know, like you said, sort of just savagery, you know, bring out your dead kind of a deal. You know what I mean? A lot of people's images of the Middle Ages come from Monty Python. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But but you get this, like, you you know, what's so sad about it is you go back and you look at you're like, oh, wait, there wasn't really a fall of, I mean, it was sort of a general transition. Oh, they transitioned to feudalism sort of subtly and, and. And you realize, oh, you know, it, it, there's a continuity here that I didn't recognize. And they were a lot smarter than we tend to give them credit for. Um, but that section on the flat earth thing, that was very fascinating. Yes, yeah. right, right. But then he in Narnia, it is a flat earth. And in Narnia, they say, oh, that star is some guiding spirit. And Eustace says, oh, in our world, they're just big balls of gas. And uh, someone says, oh, that's not what they are. That's what they're made of. 
So uh, he keeps taking these elements from the medieval worldview. Oh, right. And, he does that know, a lot. Reanimating yeah. them in his Another fiction. thing that is relevant to our podcast, because we've done multiple sessions on Tolkien, is a whole chapter where Lewis focuses on ideas of fairies. And he actually mentions Tolkien. And he says, and, and right. um, he compares medieval men to a hobbit. Oh, yeah. um, or Lewis does, right? saying, just as a hobbit loves reading a book that they've read before, that is the way medieval um, scholars would be. Mm. You read the, you value your predecessors. Yeah. You don't think, oh, I'm evolving beyond my predecessors. Right. But then, this was also interesting to me about fairies, and there was this transition between thinking of fairies and nymphs as negative. They were representatives of disorder. For instance, you have in Shakespeare, the witches in Macbeth referred to as nymphs. And right. they're, they're negative. But then Hamlet says to Ophelia, oh, nymph in thy orisons, remember me. But you wonder if that Shakespeare is kind of punning He's suspicious of Ophelia, you know? Mm. What kind of nymph is oh, she, positive yeah. or negative? Well, in Romeo and Juliet, he talks about their star, them being star-crossed Crossed lovers. lovers. Yeah. Which right. is obviously going back to this idea of astrology. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, I also like in that section where he's talking about uh, fairies or elves, about the question of size and of scale. And he, again, sort of points out that medieval people didn't think about scale in the same mm -hmm. way that we do. And so when we go back and we're like, well, how tall were they? How yeah. big were they? <laughs> Why is it inconsistent that in one section he's this big and then the other section he's this big? Um, uh, he's he, and he points out like, well, that's because that's not the way they thought. That wasn't at the forefront exactly. of their minds. They didn't make a, a character specs card that, you know, had them drawn to scale and give them, a, you know, for for them, they're more interested in. Uh, the, you know, personality, the interactions, you know, how they're connected to other things. They're not thinking about, you know, consistency of scale over time. So right. it's just, again, it's just what I love reading this book is realizing there's all these insights that he's derived from a lifetime of scholarship of all these yes. medieval sources. And you read it and you go, oh, yeah, he, he understands how they think at a level that only an expert can. Right. Uh, and mm -hmm. so it's right. very fascinating to get those kind of nuggets to come out. Mm -hmm. well, he says a painting, they didn't have a sense of perspective. Everything was foreground. Right. And their view of history was the same way. They saw themselves immediately connected with Troy and Brute comes to Britain. Uh, when Chris and I were in Germany, we went to a Marian Capel, this little mountain chapel, and Christ is on the cross. But when you look up at this little ceiling, there's a mural and it's a cloud of witnesses and there's Adam and Eve, they're looking down and they're kind of going, all right, you know, let's, let's make this thing right. You know, there's, some, <laughs> and uh, Moses is looking down and everybody in the, the uh, old Testament is kind of cheering on Christ. He does this mm. great work and it kind of illustrates how the past was very present for medievals. Yeah. They didn't yes. have a sense that this was 40,000 years ago. Right, this was uh, right. 40 million years right. ago. And also, what the benefit of what Lewis is doing is part of, and this is the time, this was the, the wash the, the, or the culture he was situated in is one of the ways to show how primitive medievals were was by their artworks yeah, because they didn't have per, use perspective. And the point is, well, they just didn't value it. Yeah. They didn't and care. Exactly. It was the, the preciousness of what they were depicting was revealed by putting gold leaf on it. Yeah. This is a precious subject, the crucifixion or the annunciation. So it, it totally changes. It totally devastates this modernist evolutionary model of humans just getting progressing smarter and smarter and smarter yeah, and smarter. Yeah. And you also realize, it, yeah, and it, not to get into art and stuff, but it's fascinating when you go back and you study those things to realize that a lot of the reasons why they painted something a certain way is because there was either a theology behind it right, right. and it was reflecting. They were actually trying to communicate a theology in a piece of art. So um, babies look like, you know, Jesus as a baby looks like a fully formed human because they were trying to say something mm -hmm. about the nature of Jesus right 
things. And then images of Christ with, you know, the two versions of the face, oh, you know, mm. those kinds of things. You, sometimes you look at that image and you go, man, they couldn't even draw human yeah. faces. That is <laughs> awful. And, and then you realize, oh, no, they were, you know, it was, they were doing it on purpose. Um, there, was a, there was a purpose and a reason behind it. Mm-hmm. I like uh, towards the end of the book, uh, in the last chapter, where he says, there's no question here of the old models being shattered by the inrush of new phenomena. In other words, we lost the medieval model because all this stuff happened. He points to, like you said earlier, David, the uh, the nova, the supernova that they witnessed and the star being extinguished. And that was a huge thing. We're like, oh, wait a second. These stars aren't eternal. Mm. They're cha- you know, some, you know, how do we save the appearances of our model? And that, that sort of the mm. open the door and the floodgates of, of new new data. And he says, the truth would seem to be the reverse, that when changes in the human mind produce a sufficient disrelish of the old model and a sufficient hankering for some new one, phenomenon to support that new one will obedient turn up. And he hints at, this was so fascinating to me, he hints at the fact that we've been told now for so long that there's this vast universe of stars, planets upon planets that have inhabitants, he says, must occur times without number, yet there's no evidence. And then he's like, then he goes on to say, but all of a sudden, once we started to be told that, evidence started to show up. Right. And this is the idea that, like, when did, uh, when did we start seeing UFOs and uh, we started speculating about aliens? It was when we were told that there were aliens, you know, science is saying, right. oh, we believe there's this many galaxies and this many planets. And so he tries to make a really good point here at the end of the chapter that oftentimes our models are based not directly on evidence but on what we want to be true, and then we will go out and we will find evidence Mm -hmm. to fit our models. And so we shouldn't place so much trust and faith in our models because oftentimes what we're doing is we this is what we want to be true, and then we're going to go, the evidence will show up. So he says, um, no model is a catalog of ultimate realities, and none is a mere fantasy. Each is a serious attempt to get in all the phenomena known at a given period and each succeeds in getting in a great many. But then he says ours will die a death. But he says nature gives most of her evidence in answer to the questions that we ask her. Yes. And so this idea that the answers that we're getting tell us a lot more about the questions that we're asking right. than they right. do about the truth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I definitely, you know, without getting into too much, I definitely see a lot of that these days. It's sort of like, well, this is the new model that we've adopted related to this, that, or the other. And as soon as we adopt that new model, we start discovering evidence that proves it. Mm-hmm. Right. right. Yeah. Hence conspiracy theories. <laughs> well, yeah, and yeah, it's why it's so easy to get trapped into conspiracy theories. Because yeah. if you come to a conclusion that this is the case, mm-hmm. everything you see will then start fitting into that model. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And choosing to believe what you want to believe to support the model. You find what you're looking for. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you could argue that science is more humble now than it was when Lewis yes. wrote this book. Is they come up with dark energy and dark matter, and is there some sort of, uh, you know, brains or there's, uh, what, what's the other th- string theory? Yeah. They're starting to go, well, there's a whole bunch of constructs. Are there alternate universes? Uh, you could argue that science is actually more in accord with theology as a pursuit of truth, an eternal pursuit of truth, mm-hmm. rather than we are slowly uncovering the nature of reality. Mm-hmm. And yeah. We're getting closer and closer. We mm-hmm. have an exact model of reality. If anything, we're going the opposite direction. Well, and they're also, I mean, in, in the in defense of science these days, um, if you watch any uh, videos or in discussion, I've, there's a, a, a astrophysicist I like to follow. She's at Oxford, and she's been talking about a lot of the James Webb Space Telescope stuff that's mm-hmm. been coming out. And you it's, follow her on, on social media? Uh, well, she has a YouTube channel where she yeah, explains okay. academic papers and stuff. You're not a stalker. I thought you were a stalker. Yeah. No, 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 no. There's a scientist that I like to follow. <laughs> her I name saw her is, at a restaurant the other night. Her name night. is Dr. <laughs> Becky. She has a great oh, okay, YouTube Dr. channel. Becky. talks okay. about astrophysicist stuff. Um, but anyways, she's she's constantly talking about this crisis in cosmology is what they're being, mm. it's being called. Mm. And, and all they're saying is we have these models of how we think the universe works and how we've calculated how old it is. And there's two models that they came up with and they disagree with each other. <laughs> and then the James Webb Space Telescope comes along and it's adding new data to the mix and it's not helping them. <laughs> and so, but they're having this internal discussion where they're like, well, clearly we're making some mistakes here, which one is right. And they're going back and they're revisiting their evidence. And so to me, it's encouraging because they're rather than saying like, okay, well we have figured it out and we know that this is the truth. They're saying, 
well, we something must be wrong. We must be off somewhere. Let's see if we can figure it out right. and see how we can, what's the best way to save the appearances based on what we have. And right. So they've, they've more moved into that sort of postmodern uh, space of saying, you know, we understand that this is not reality. Yes. This is a model that we have that's trying to approximate it. Yes. yes. So I definitely think there's a lot of value in reading this. But like you said, Crystal, it's, it's, it is kind of like going on a hike. Where there are sections yes. of the trail where you're you're you're, you're surrounded by you're, <laughs> you're surrounded by trees and you're just hot and sweaty and you're like when do I get to the view? Well, it, it started out as a series of lectures that you got to hear once or twice a week over several months. Mm -hmm. So I don't we're kind of like binge reading trying yeah. to get through all these lectures in mm -hmm. you know one book or for one session. Mm -hmm. But very worthy thinking of the implications that. Lewis is presenting. Yeah. It also shows the depth of the scholarship. Oh my gosh. There's this whole expanse of scholarly knowledge that goes beyond anything you read in the apologetics books or the fiction. It's kind of, it's mind boggling to think about the, how he can connect these authors over the span of like 2000 mm -hmm. years going back all the way right. to these sort of like pre Jesus authors and, and Rome and things like that. And, and in my mind, I'm like, I have a hard time. You have a hard time in school specializing in, you know, a period of 150, 200 <laughs> years. Yeah, I know, like, I know. Wow. And he's like, and then this person wrote this and then wrote this. And you're like, okay, wow. Mm -hmm. So well, yeah. I like what he says. Well, we all know the famous dream sequence in Scipio Scipionis or something like that. Oh yeah. The famous yeah. dream oh, sequence. Yeah, that one. <laughs> we were just talking about that last night. Yeah. Of course, his generation, anybody who went to Oxford or Cambridge, yeah, they were they reading that. That, that was yeah. part of education. Right. It was Greek and Latin classics. Yeah. So we, our education has radically changed yeah. since so then. So if you start feeling bad, remember that Lewis thought that uh, Tito was the king of Gr Greece and yeah. he thought a slug was a kind of reptile. <laughs> yeah. So we all have areas where we have a lot yes, of depth yes. and other areas where we have not so much well, depth. Well, with that enlightening comment, exactly. maybe we yes. should close this podcast. Okay. Thanks, Thanks for listening. The Wade Center Podcast is a production of the Marion E. Wade Center at Wheaton College in Wheaton, Illinois. Our hosts are the co-directors of the Wade Center, Drs. Crystal and David C. Downing. Our episodes are produced and edited by Aaron M. Hill. If you enjoy the podcast and the content we offer, please leave us a review on iTunes, tell your friends, and consider making a donation to The Wade. The Wade Center is entirely self-funded. Financial gifts help support the expert services, past collections, and varied programming we offer at no cost. If you have questions about the podcast or suggestions for future episodes, please email us at wade at wheaton.edu or contact us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. To learn more about the Wade Center, our seven British Christian authors, what we offer, and how to make a donation, visit our website at wheaton.edu slash wade.